everyone. Welcome to Wonder House. Are you having a good time? Awesome. Well, welcome. I'm uh, Carmi Garzion, and I'm the Dean of the College of Science, and I'm really pleased to introduce one of our faculty members in the College of Science, Dr. Erica Hand Hamden. Dr. Hamden is an assistant professor in the Department of Astronomy and an assistant astronomer for the Stewart Observatory at the University of Arizona. Erica's research focuses on ultraviolet instrumentation, detector technology development, multi-object and IFU spectroscopy, galaxy evolution, star formation. Dr. Hamden is interested in large-scale galactic outflows and inflows and understanding molecular hydrogen in nearby star-forming regions. This enables us to advance our understanding of uh, the way that stars form. So Eric is also a PI in Hyperion, a mission under development that is designed to observe molecular hydrogen in our galaxy to better understand star formation. And she's also the deputy PI of ASPRA, a NASA pioneer's mission which, which will observe nearby edge-on galaxies in the extreme ultraviolet range. ASPRA is scheduled to launch in 2025, so look out for that. So Erica is going to talk to you about a guide to inventing the future. That's a pretty lofty goal. How do we invent the future? So, and the point she's going to make that is that progress isn't driven by lone geniuses who toil away in the lab. It's driven by new technology and by the imperfect, slow, and laborious work that goes into technology development. So true disruptive science is very different than what you might think. We're going to hear a little bit more about that, how invention leads to disruption through the experiences of Dr. Erica Handen. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, and hopefully at the end of this talk, you'll know exactly how to invent the future. So on July 12th of last year, NASA unveiled images from its newest flagship space telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope. And these images are extraordinary. This is a deep field, not even that deep, this is like a mediumly deep field, showing us some of the most distant, ancient galaxies that we have ever observed. This little red dot here, this is one of the oldest galaxies that we have ever seen. Almost every dot in this image is a galaxy. And this telescope is going to transform our understanding of the early universe as more images and more data come in. And it won't just transform our understanding of the early universe, it's going to transform our understanding of our entire universe. And transformation is what I'm interested in. Every time NASA puts up a new telescope, every time we discover a new way to observe the universe around us, we discover new amazing things about our universe. So here's another picture from JWST. This is um, a star-forming cloud in our own galaxy called the Chameleon Dark Cloud. And we can look at it with this image, which gives us some information about like, the structure of the clouds. We see these stars here. But one of the really unique and powerful capabilities that James Webb has is its spectroscopic capability. So what you can do is take a point in this image, and instead of looking at just the total integrated light in that point, you can split it up into its spectrum. And it looks like this. And what you can do with this is figure out what is in that cloud that you're observing. So this is composed of water ice, carbon dioxide ice, um, methanol, methane ice, ethanol, acetone, a bunch of interesting molecules that we can tell are in this cloud because of JWST and its spectroscopic mode. JWST isn't just going to look at clouds and galaxies, but it's also going to observe planets around other stars. And not just the planets themselves, but the atmospheres of those planets. And it does that, again, using spectroscopy, where you can take the light and split it up into its constituent wavelengths, and you can figure out things like what is the atmosphere composed of. If you looked at the atmosphere of the Earth, you would see a tremendous amount of nitrogen. You would see oxygen, which is one of the key signatures of life. Looking at other planets and their atmospheres, we can tell, are they mostly CO2, like the atmosphere of Mars? Are they nitrogen and oxygen, like Earth? Are they uh, sulfuric acid, like Venus? This mode is incredibly powerful for being able to tell whether a planet might be hospitable for life. 
Another mode is to look at those extremely old galaxies. And actually, the only way that you know that those galaxies are extremely old is to take a spectrum of them. So this is showing part of the deep field. And those little boxes are each these tiny red dots, kind of uninspiring. But what we're actually looking at here are galaxies that were forming in the very infancy of the universe. Our conception of how galaxies form, we thought that it took kind of a long time. Some of these galaxies, like this one at the top, that galaxy had formed when the universe was only 300 million years old. It's not a lot of time in the grand scheme of our universe. And so these, this like initial data and the spectrum that we get from it is telling us that galaxies formed way earlier than we thought that they did. And we have to revise our understanding of how galaxies formed and how early that can happen. And JWST, this incredible instrument, it cost billions of dollars. It has been in development in some shape or form for over 30 years. It was originally conceived of as a follow-up to the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's unique in a lot of ways. It's the largest telescope that's ever been put into space. It um, has this segmented mirror, which actually folded up when it was put into the rocket and then had to unfold in space. There was like over 100 single-point failures, but every single thing worked correctly. But in order for this telescope to go up and to operate and to give us these exquisite images, it actually took longer than 30 years of development. There was technologies that started development decades before anyone had even conceived of this telescope. And so I want to talk about one of them, because part of inventing the future is coming up with technology just because you're interested in it and seeing where it leads you. So in 1965, there was a researcher at Westinghouse Labs named Harvey Nathanson. And he discovered that you could fabricate small mechanical devices on a nanoscale integrated into circuitry. So this is the patent that he filed a couple of years later. It's for a bandpass uh, filter. And it's basically a little mechanical rod. Electric currents pass underneath it, and the rod moves. And then there's an electrical circuit at the other end of the rod. And you might be like, what is this? So this is a micro electromechanical system. It's called a MEMS. And this is interesting because small mechanical systems that are completely seamlessly integrated into electrical systems is basically responsible for the miniaturization of everything since the 1960s. So this is a real functional gear with like um, a little chain attached to it. The chain is the thickness of a human hair. And you can fabricate these in the same process that you can fabricate, like silicon chips. It's a seamless integration of electrical and mechanical systems. You don't need like a human with a CNC machine like cutting things. And these MEMS are in a tremendous amount of consumer products. They're in inkjet printers. They're in your cell phone. Everyone that has a cell phone has a MEMS in their, on their person right now. And this is an, an example of that. This is the accelerometer in a cell phone, and it basically consists of these um, veins. One set of veins is fixed, and the other set can move when you like shake your phone. And that motion, it, the two veins act as capacitors. The motion of one of them subtly changes the capacitance of the system, which is read out by an electrical circuit that is seamlessly integrated. And then the phone knows exactly how you're moving. And there's multiple of them. This one is oriented one way, this one is oriented another way, and then there'll be a third one oriented 90 degrees from both of those, and that gives you the three axes of motion. And so the cell phones rely tremendously on MEMS, but a bunch of other things do, airbags in your car, inkjet printers. But what about space and JWST? So JWST, the spectros spectroscopic mode, also relies on one of these MEMS. So in order to do spectroscopy, you need to block almost all of the light from your image and just allow through a tiny window for the object that you're interested in. Then through that window, you spread out all the photons. If you didn't block out everything else, you would have a lot of confusion in your system because the light from one galaxy would overlap with the light from another galaxy. And so these are pictures of the, what are called micro shutter arrays that were put on JWST that are based entirely on that original MEMS concept. Um, the research for this started in the 1990s. There was a big discussion about what's the best way to build the spectrograph in a way that is dynamic and reliable. And so you don't want to just have a single 
point that you have to move your telescope every time you want to look at a galaxy. You want to be able to look at multiple galaxies the way that we did here, where you can dynamically change which part of the image are you taking a spectrum from and which part are you not. And so these shutters can flip open and then closed again. And the design actually was so good. Originally, it was supposed to be um, an array of shutters, 128 by 128 shutters. And the ones that they put in were 365 by 171 shutters. So it was actually a, a significant improvement over what they needed. And each of these shutters is 80 microns by 180 microns. These are teeny tiny. They have to open at exactly the right angle so that they don't block the light. They have to close exactly when they're told to close. They need to do this millions of miles away from the Earth perfectly every single time. And so this key capability is only possible because over 60 years ago, someone in a lab was messing around with fabrication techniques. And there's lots of other examples of this for JWST. Um, you know, the mirror technology took 30 years of development. Um, the being able to fold it up and then unfold it again, it's a tremendous tool that is only possible because of all of, the, all of these decades of development. And one of the things that I love about JWST is the fact that the images are so information rich. So this is a, um, the Blue Ring Nebula, a beautiful nebula. This is a, a star in our own galaxy that is dying. And in its death, it sheds its um, outer layers, and that's what creates this ring. But you'll notice there's a little, a little thing here, over here. What is this? It's a galaxy. JWST takes pictures of a bunch of things that are not galaxies, and in the background of every single image, there are galaxies, because it is so precise and such an exquisite telescope. Here's another example, which is also, I like, love all of these examples. So this is Jupiter, the biggest planet in our solar system. JWST took a picture of Jupiter because it was trying to figure out, the team was trying to determine how well could it track Jupiter in the sky, how well can it track objects, because Jupiter is moving quickly compared to like a distant galaxy. And so they took this image. The telescope is like slewing to keep Jupiter in the same field of view. And they did a good job. You can see like the great red spot. This is an infrared picture, so it's not going to have the same colors that you might imagine. These um, bright spots here and here are the auroras on Jupiter on the north and south pole. But there's also galaxies in this picture. There are right over here. These three objects are galaxies. This object is one of the moons of Jupiter. You can see Jupiter's ring. But even this picture, where, where the telescope is actually moving while it integrates, you can see galaxies in this. And I think about the transformation that JWST is going to give us in our understanding of the universe, and also about the, the technology that was needed to actually put this telescope in space and make it good enough that we can get that transformation. And so I keep talking about transformation. and. It, it's not just for things like astronomy, where you put up a telescope and you discover something incredible about the universe. I think of transformation as something that is like a key to creating the, all the lives that all of us have today. It's like a leap in understanding, in capability, in access. It's progress for everybody, bringing everyone along. And I want you to think about like a house in the 1800s, let's say the early 1800s, no running water, no appliances, no electricity. And then think about a house today, the house that you live in, where you have this transformation in what your house is like, what it has, what you can do in it. And that transformation is only possible through a combination of basic research that moves the technology forward, and then also commercialization and development that actually gets it out of a laboratory and into your house, or into your cell phone, or into your car. And it can create this fundamental shift in how we live our lives, and how we experience the world and the universe around us. And so this application of new technology is something that I've become more and more interested in. So there's more examples from the history of astronomy. Historically, every time a new technology has been used in astronomy, we discover a new and usually crazy thing about the universe. So using a different telescope example, everyone thinks that Galileo invented the telescope, but he didn't. It was invented by a Dutch eyeglass maker named Hans Lippershey, who in 1608 takes two lenses and puts them together in a tube and then looks through them. 
And there's some apocryphal stories about like why did he do this. Um, one of the stories is that he saw some children playing with the lenses and was like, oh, what are they up to? And I just feel like, well, it's 1608. Lenses are probably really expensive. I don't think that's how it happened. There's actually a couple of arguments that other people invented it. He filed a patent, which actually was not accepted. Um, but so he came up with this scheme, two lenses in a tube, and you can see distant objects with it. And it was called the Dutch eyeglass, and the, or the far-seeing um, far glasses. And most of the people who heard about it thought of it for like military use, like, oh, you can look and see someone really far away, you can like spy on people. But there was a scientist in Italy who heard about the patent from some gossip in Venice and was like, hey, I can do a better job with this. So that was Galileo. And he made his own telescopes, which actually were much better than Hans Lippert Hayes' versions of the telescope. And you can visit them in a museum in Florence. And he was the first person to take this new technology, and instead of using it for stuff on the Earth, he pointed it upwards and looked like, what is in the sky? And it's kind of amazing, because you can go and look up what he published. He wrote a book called The Starry Messenger. He wrote a couple of other things, which got him into a lot of trouble with a bunch of people. Um, one of the things that he observed was the moon, and he does this drawing of the moon based on what he sees through this little telescope. And he notices that the moon was not a perfect sphere. The moon had these craters in it, these like divots. It had a depth. It wasn't, it wasn't a perfect sphere, which is what the conception of the universe was, that the Earth was the unmoving center of the universe, and everything rotated around it, and everything was perfectly spherical. And the moon isn't perfectly spherical, and Galileo sees this, writes it down, and publishes it. He also looks at Jupiter, one of the brightest objects in the night sky, and he looks at it over the course of many months. He keeps returning to Jupiter again and again, and he makes these notes in his notebooks. Jupiter is the circle, and he notices when he first looked at Jupiter, he wrote down that he saw there were three stars really close to Jupiter, and he thought that was just happenstance, like he just happened to look and these are background stars. And then he goes back the next day and he sees that, the, that Jupiter has pulled the stars along with it. And they're still around Jupiter. And every day he goes back and they're still around Jupiter and it turns out there's four stars. One of them was hiding behind Jupiter. And he fills notebooks with this, always looking at Jupiter and the stars that are around Jupiter. And he realizes after a lot of time that these are moons that are orbiting Jupiter and that that meant that the Earth wasn't the center of everything because here are some objects orbiting a different thing that isn't the Earth. This was one of the key pieces of evidence that the Earth wasn't the center of the universe and that our conception of the universe was wrong. And you only get this evidence with the telescope. You can't see this just with the human eye, which is why we didn't figure it out a long time ago. So you need the technology in order to move the science forward. And so you might be like, what do I know about technology? Um, and I know what's needed for transformation because I spend most of my days developing technology, building telescopes, and working on detectors to try and make those telescopes better. So this is pictures of me from um, one of the missions I've worked on called Fireball, which is a balloon-borne UV telescope. I've also spent a bunch of time in the lab. Some of these pictures are over a decade old, um, trying to make telescopes better, trying to make detectors better. And I know that this process is really slow. I started working on some of these projects in 2008, so we're coming up on like 15 years of work on some of these. And this process of innovation and discovery is really slow and it's really laborious and it's not for everybody and it's not even for every scientist because there's never really a guarantee that your experiment is going to work or that your project is right or that your galaxies are going to cooperate when you actually build the thing to go and look at them. And that's the flip side of basic research, of doing this type of thing, because on the one hand, you might invent the transistor and create everything that has come since 1947. On the other hand, you might be creating bubble memory technology. And hopefully all of you are like, bubble memory technology? <laughs> what is that? I've never heard of it. And there's a good reason that you have never heard of it. Um, this was a different type of digital storage that um, people were experimenting with, so this is, oops, this is over here, the, the bubble memory chip, and it was basically replaced by things which were faster and better the way that like, we don't use Betamax or like laser discs, those are other formats that just didn't catch on. So now we use silicon-based either spinning discs or more recent solid state devices. 
So the flip side for basic research is that you're going to fund a bunch of development that doesn't go anywhere, or maybe doesn't go anywhere immediately. Um, and one of the kind of motivators for basic research was this report written in 1945 um, by Vannevar Bush called Science, the Endless Frontier, which was one of the other names for this talk. And the, the premise of this report is that if you fund basic research, that is the basis on which everything is built, and with that, you can invent the future. But there is a little problem with just funding basic research, and it's that you need basic research and then you need to build on it. You can't just leave it alone. And to give you a little better definition of basic research, you need to support things that don't necessarily have a purpose when you're doing them. So these are famous images, the first images taken of DNA by Rosalind Franklin, um, stick, pointing x-rays into DNA and seeing the images that come out. And this she did because she was interested just in how DNA is structured. She wasn't thinking about medical applications decades in the future. She just wanted to know how does this molecule work. There's tons of other examples of this. So Ernest Rutherford, who shot protons into a gold foil and discovered the structure of the atom, and that the nucleus is actually this like super tight contained ball. This basic research is just like discovery for its own sake. And humans, I think, have a natural desire to know more about the world around us, and so basic research is fulfilling that desire. It's this creative endeavor. If it, it makes the folds in your brain happy. Like, why do I like doing this? I don't know. That's like what my brain wants me to do, so that's what I'm doing. Um, but I actually think it's interesting. It's actually very close to making art. It's this creative process where you're trying to do something that no one has ever done before. You feel compelled to do it, and you have no idea if anyone is ever going to appreciate it when you put it out in the world. You don't know what's going to catch on, whether it will gain traction or not, or if you're just creating the bubble memory that will disappear into the past. And that like traction isn't really up to the artist or to the scientist. You don't really know which basic research program is going to actually turn into progress later on. And that's one of the tricky things about basic research is that you have to be willing to fund a bunch of things that don't necessarily make any sense to you or that you're not sure if they're going to lead somewhere. But a lot of it is like incredible. So the relationship between like basic research and human progress isn't linear. It's a little tricky. So one of, one of the things that I think is like so interesting, so in 1915, everyone's favorite Swiss patent clerk, Albert Einstein, wrote this paper in German on general relativity. It was an expansion of his work from a decade before about special relativity, and it basically created a new conception of the universe that there wasn't time separate from space, separate from gravity, there was this one thing called space-time. And this predicted things like black holes, it actually predicted very precisely the orbit of Mercury, which had been a, a long-standing problem that Newtonian gravity wasn't able to um, answer. The orbit of Mercury processes just a little bit, so it's not a perfectly closed ellipse. Over time, this is an exaggeration of what the orbit does, but over time, the orbit kind of moves around and makes this, this flower shape. And if you just have Newtonian gravity, you cannot explain why it does this. If you have general relativity, you can explain this perfectly. And you might be like, well, general relativity feels very theoretical. Like, what impact does it have on your life? Are you going to Mercury anytime soon? Probably not. But in fact, if you got here using the GPS on your phone, then you used general relativity. So G GPS relies on a bunch of satellites that are in orbit. And your phone pings the satellite, and it very precisely knows the time difference between when the ping left the satellite and when it gets to your phone. That timing has to be precise to like 20 nanoseconds. And general relativity does such a good job of predicting the gravitational field of the Earth that if you didn't have it, your GPS would be off by six miles. And it's six miles a day. Every day that you turned off general relativity in your calculations, the, the, the mistake of six miles would get more and more wrong over time. And so did Einstein have any idea that like, this application would be useful for this seemingly extremely theoretical work on gravity? Like, no. Satellites wouldn't go up for another 50 years. But it turned out that his desire to explain the world around him is the reason that we have GPS on our phones. And without it, we wouldn't be able to go anywhere. Another fun example is the invention of photography. So in 1838, Louis Daguerre developed this emulsion that when you expose it to light and then treat it with a chemical process, 
creates an image which is stable over time. So this was the daguerreotype, the first lasting photograph. This is him. And shortly after, a few people, uh, some uh, French astronomers requested that he take pictures of the moon with it. And so these are some of the earliest pictures of the moon. This picture can be a little confusing. So the moon itself is this, is the this, this smaller circle inside this dark circle. You can see the, the terminator, the line between light and dark here. So these are some of the earliest pictures of the moon. And photography was invented so that artists could take pictures of things, so that people could record what was going on around them. It wasn't, just like the telescope, it wasn't originally conceived of like, oh, let's use this to take pictures of space. But very quickly, astronomers realized that they could take these pictures of space. And um, there was a whole team of astronomers that worked with George Eastman, who would later go on to found Eastman Kodak, to develop better emulsions that would last for longer, that could stand up for hour-long exposures while you, so your telescope tracks the sky. There was even, the Eastman Kodak company even had a book about photographic plates for use in spectroscopy and astronomy. This is an early picture of the Orion Nebula. And this technology is so important because it's the reason that we know how big the universe is. So a lot had changed since Galileo looked at Jupiter. These photographic plates are from Edwin Hubble, who was observing in the 1920s. This one is from 1923, and he's taking a picture of Andromeda. And at the time, he didn't know if Andromeda was a part of our own galaxy, like a small nebula, or if it was its own galaxy, super massive and really far away. And he figures this out because he looks at this plate and he sees this star here, which he originally labeled as N, which means nova, which is like a, something new and bright. And he realized it's not a nova, it's a variable star. So he crosses it out and writes VAR. And the, just to give you a sense of like how challenging this is, this is the plate that he was comparing it to. And you would have to go between these two plates taken at different points in time, which before the photograph was not possible. And then notice like, oh, this star here is slightly brighter in this plate than it is in this plate, so that means something is changing. And this variable star m meant that he could tell the distance to Andromeda, and then when he knew the distance, he could figure out the size of Andromeda, and he realized that Andromeda was not part of our own galaxy, it was its own galaxy, hundreds of millions of miles, or hundreds of millions of light years away from our galaxy, and that the universe was actually gigantic. The universe wasn't just confined to our own little galaxy. And for comparison, this is the star right in that bottom corner which we can still observe today, the star that told us how big the universe is. And this picture, this photograph, is basically the most important image that has ever been taken in astronomy. But maybe astronomy isn't your thing. So here's another example. mRNA, messenger RNA. The research that went into the mRNA COVID vaccines, which maybe some of you have taken, was first discovered in the 1960s, and that research wasn't with a medical application in mind, it was just because the researchers were interested in figuring out how proteins were delivered in cells and the way that cells worked. The M in, in mRNA stands for messenger. The nucleus makes it, and then um, it enters the cell, and proteins get made. And so this basic process was just to understand, like, how do cells work, and what role does mRNA play in that process? And it's interesting because mRNA is something which is an example of basic research that could have failed very easily because it's pretty unstable outside of the cell. And that instability meant that a lot of the promise that people saw in it wasn't really realized um, because if you don't wrap it in the right kind of lipid structure, which is what's shown here, it will disintegrate. And even then, with the right lipid structure, it's still pretty unstable and you need to keep it really cold to make sure that it doesn't um, fall apart. But so the field of mRNA research basically was narrowed down to just a few people for about 20 years, from the, mid, from the 90s to the early 2000s, until those few people figured out how to make this lipid encapsulation of the mRNA and make it stable. After that, a bunch of companies, once this problem was solved, a bunch of companies then came in to try and see what else they could do with mRNA, and there was a whole flood of research money applied research because you're trying to figure out uses for something that already exists. But I think about like some of these early vaccines, there was a rabies vaccine, um, an Ebola vaccine for diseases that are really awful. And like, what would have happened if people had spent more time and money developing mRNA in the early 90s instead of just those handful of people? And so basic research alone isn't the key to inventing the future. Basic research is a component of it, but what you also have to do is have people who 
are working on ways to like scale things up, bring it bring your ideas out into the world. Because if you invent something or you discover something and nobody ever uses it, have you discovered anything at all? It doesn't matter. And so one of the, like, this weird thing that is stuck in my brain is an example of this. So I've always wanted to be an astronaut, um, go to space, and obviously that's like a little bit easier now than it was in the past, but it's still not easy to get to space. I don't have any friends that are billionaires. Um, but so I want to contrast getting to space with flying. So in 1903, the Wright brothers built an airplane and achieved the first powered flight at Kitty Hawk. This is a picture of it. You used to have to lay along the wing. This is like Orville right here. And you pull levers to move the airplane. So the airplane flew for like 40 seconds, but this was a, tr a transformative event in history. But if the only people who ever flew were the Wright brothers, would any of us care about this? No. Just six years after that first flight, in 1909, the first commercial airline was founded in Germany. And in 1914, the first regularly scheduled airline flight started taking place January 1st, 1914, from St. Petersburg, Florida to Tampa, Florida, a grand total of 23 miles. They didn't even have airports or runways, so it was actually an airboat. It was the St. Petersburg-Tampa airboat line. And so it was 11 years from the first invention of this technology to when it was accessible to, to mostly everybody. Just over a decade. And I want to contrast that with this other way of getting around, getting into space with rockets. Rockets were, the first like modern rocket was developed in 1926, not that long after the first airplane. This is Robert Goddard, who Goddard Space Flight Center is named after, with one early rocket, the rocket part is just this top bit, and another early rocket. And so if we follow the same trajectory, there should have been commercial rocket companies in 1932, and then regularly scheduled liftoffs for people in 1937. But obviously, that wasn't the case. In 1932 and 1935, this is the size of the rockets, obviously challenging to fit people in there. And also, like, I know that getting to space is harder than just taking off from St. Petersburg and going to Tampa, Florida, but I still feel like, should it have taken 100 years to get to the point? We don't even really have a com like regularly scheduled rocket flights that you can take up. And so, I wonder about stagnation in different realms of our lives. And we can feel like, oh, there's so much change happening because of the internet. It feels like progress all the time. But it's not necessarily progress. And like those at-home COVID rapid tests, that is definitely progress. I'm not, I'm not talking negatively about that. But this is an incredible advance where you can like take a swab at home. In 15 minutes, you can tell whether or not you have a, a disease. There are rapid strep tests that you could buy, but you have to be like a medical professional in order to use them. But I want to know, like, where is the test that tests for everything? That isn't just like one COVID test, but is like, oh, do you have flu A? Do you have flu B? Do you have strep? Do you have this other thing? What other common illnesses? And so like, where is the progress in that? In making it easier for you to understand what your body is doing? Or even your house, if you drop someone off from 1980 in your house today, they wouldn't have the same feeling of like wonder as someone from 1800 dropped off in your house. A person from 1980 would recognize every single thing, and they would probably just be like, why does your fridge need to connect to the internet? And I think about this in other realms too. You know, it's so much easier to get things into space, but is that progress? So recently, there have been a lot of constellations of satellites that are getting put up into the night sky with very little regulation. And this is sometimes sold as a way to bring internet to people in rural areas um, to make regular people's lives better. But as an astronomer, like these are what some of the images from ground-based telescopes look like if the constellation happens to pass over the telescope when you're observing. And these are basically blotting out the night sky for a huge fraction of humanity. And one of the things is like, oh, well, you should just put your telescopes in space. But like, what if you go to the darkest parts of the Earth? This is in Australia. And you look up and you see these satellites coming overhead. This desire to look at the night sky is a fundamental human right that is getting taken away from us in the name of progress. But I don't think that this is progress. And so it's tricky to develop new technology and then use it responsibly, or to develop technology 
and actually just use it. Progress isn't promised, even when we have the tools to do something. The, the photovoltaic cell was invented in the 1830s, around the same time that the photographic plate was invented. The modern solar panel, with like reasonably good efficiency, was developed in 1950 in Bell Labs. And this is a good example of how basic research alone isn't enough. You can't just invent the solar panel, you have to do something with it. Jimmy Carter put solar panels on the roof of the White House, and then Ronald Reagan took them down. And America lost several decades of work on this resource. And so I live in Arizona, and I feel like, well, you have solar panels, you have an infinite power source in the desert. The Japanese, actually, during this time in the 80s and 90s, they basically took to the forefront of solar panel research. They combined basic research with commercialization and were a powerhouse in solar, and we've been behind for a really long time and are only now just catching up. So one of the other things about basic research is that sometimes there are people who don't want the status quo to change, who would prefer that you know, we keep using whale oil to light our houses. But is anyone here sad that like, the whale oil tycoons aren't as rich as they used to be? Like, no, you'd much rather have electricity than whale oil. And there's a lot of stuff that basic research alone isn't going to get you. You have to push for it. And so what's the solution to this? Like, science can be an endless frontier, but we have to follow it where it goes. And you can't just assume that basic research alone will move society forward. And there's a lot of inertia and a tendency towards stagnation. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of, of um, calls to action about how you can do something about this. So the first thing is that basic research can feel like it doesn't lead anywhere, or like you don't understand what it is. But you have to be open to it, to, the, to discoveries. When Einstein published that paper, he actually never won a Nobel Prize for general relativity because it made people so uncomfortable. They were like, this is not the way the universe works. We don't like it. But you have to be open to new things and to the fact that like, your conception of the universe is going to get blown up. You have to talk with people about those new discoveries. Like I said before, if you invent something and no one ever knows, you haven't invented anything at all. You have to share it. You have to spread your knowledge. Especially in 2023 in America, you have to call out people who have a lack of basic understanding of the process of science. That like, just because the research topic is about fruit flies and you don't know why fruit flies matter, doesn't mean that it doesn't matter. If you're a nicer person than me, you could teach those people about why it matters. But that basic research has this incredible value that you can't decide ahead of time. So you just have to let people follow what is interesting to them. You have to apply pressure. So every single person in this room, you can call a, your representative. One of the major sources of basic research funding is the US government, and that funding is declining over time. Now there's companies that fund certain types of research, but not the sort of generally useful basic research. So you can pressure your elected officials. You can reach out to your legislatures. The state can promote basic research. The federal government can promote basic research. Foundations can promote basic research. And then if you are one of those funding sources, you should give more money to it. This is the kind of thing that, like, yeah, it's not going to yield you a return on investment next year. It's going to yield a return on investment in 30 years. But that return is going to be incredible. And so you have to be willing to put investment in now for some time in the future. And then finally, if you're an entrepreneur here, you should be the next Bell Labs. Bell Labs was a part of AT&T, which at the time had this monopoly from the US government for telecom. And AT&T put a tiny fraction of its budget into Bell Labs every year with the idea that they would invent technology to make AT&T a better company, to make the telecom better, more seamless, more efficient, make more money. And so the scientists at Bell Labs had this prerogative to just like, figure things out, and they were working on a timeline of decades, not like next quarter we have to deliver some, we have to invent the transistor and deliver it. But Bell Labs invented basically the entire world that we're living in. I mean, to be fair to other places, it's not just Bell Labs. There was a bunch of other research companies like this. There was one for Xerox. Um, there was the Westinghouse company where Harvey Nathanson invented the uh, first MEMS device. But this attitude, that basic research is the foundation upon which all technological advances rest is a key component that we can't forget. So this quote is from Mervyn Kelly, who was the director of research at Bell Labs and eventually the president of Bell, the director of Bell Labs in the 1950s. And so 
I think about like this potential for progress that we have. There's so many smart people working on so many interesting things, but we have to take those ideas and move them forward and not be scared that the status quo is gonna change. And so if we do this, what do we get? We get better lives for everyone. We get a safer, more sustainable planet, and we get a deeper understanding of the universe that we live in. And so progress isn't just me building a telescope that will let us observe the stars. I think real progress is that all of us could go to the stars and maybe have this view. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any questions. This is maybe the most important picture that has ever been taken. This is from Apollo 8, or Apollo 8, the first time people went to the moon and the Earth is rising above the moon, and this basically started the modern environmental movement. Question? So, so yeah. Um, so clearly it's not a necessity for somebody doing basic research to have the future in mind, to have that, first, that vision. Yeah. But how important, or at least how is it an alternative perspective on basic research for researchers, people in the academic community, to really think about the impact of what they're doing in that context, right? As, aside from just, I'm discovering, yeah. to really think about how it's going to be applied. Like, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, so that's, that's tricky, because like, the work on the atom with like Rutherford and the nucleus, like that directly leads to nu both nuclear power and nuclear bombs. And so the, that's, that's like a tough question because like, do, is it, would I want to give up our understanding of the atom so that the nuclear bomb could never be made? Like, no, absolutely not. But then at the same time, you create this thing which you can't control um, and you just have to try and hope that the rest of society has the right guardrails to kind of keep us from destroying ourselves. But I think that's, a, that's like a fundamental problem with the growth of technology. And like, do you at some point create something that destroys you? Um, and I feel like I'm not enough of a philosopher to give like a really good answer for that. <laughs> but it's tricky, and I, and um, I think I think the scientist would say, well, I, I don't, I'm not the person that's making the bomb. I just want to know how this thing works. Um, but I guess for me personally, like, there's a reason that I work in the ultraviolet, which has absolutely no uses on the surface of the Earth. So like, I don't have to worry about those kind of questions. Yeah, I was wondering how or what advice you'd offer to overcome management's objection that this division isn't earning a profit every quarter or increasing the business in some way. Yeah. Because that's such a pressure these days that didn't exist in the 60s. Yes. Yeah, like Bell Labs never had a requirement to turn a profit at all. Um, I, think, I think that the management has to understand, like, what is the... The, the modern, I, I guess the modern conception of corporations that like the number one objective is to like make the shareholders happy or to have like short term goals. I mean, I think that's wrong. Um, and I think the companies that do best are the ones that invest in the long term and that have like, aren't just chasing the latest trends. I feel like there's probably a whole bunch of data that you could gather. I mean, it, it sort of depends because I feel like there's certain people who, like, it doesn't matter what you show them, they just want to do the thing that they want to do, in which case I would say, well, leave that company and work somewhere else. Um, but there are people where you could demonstrate, like, these companies invest on a, in projects on, like, a five or ten year horizon, and they do well in the long run, and that's what people are looking for. But there's a lot of, like, mismatched incentives, I think, that are hard to come to get past. And even Bell Labs, like when AT&T got broken up, Bell Labs got sold to, they, they've been part of a couple of different companies and they don't invent things like that anymore. Well, thank you so much for coming. If you have any questions, feel free to come up.